Hello, and welcome to today's virtual program with Inforum at the Commonwealth Club. I'm Alicia Garza, principal of the Black Futures Lab and co-founder of the Black Lives Matter Global Network. I am so, so excited to be in conversation today with my sister, Linda Sarsour. She is an activist, an organizer, and the co-chair of the 2017 Women's March. She is here to discuss her new book, We Are Not Here to Be Bystanders, a memoir of love and resistance which is now available for purchase at your local bookstore or at barnesandnoble.com. If you'd like to ask her a question, please ask it in the chat if you are watching on YouTube or in the comments if you're watching us on Facebook. Linda, thank you so much for joining us today. Are you ready to get started? So let me just start off with a basic question. I like to ask all of my badass friends, were you just born excellent or what happened? What, what What's going on? <laughs> you know, I'd like to say that my mom uh, birthed a living legend. Just kidding. Um, I was, uh, you know, <laughs> I was born, I think, uh, to extraordinary human beings that had extraordinary circumstances uh, and that instilled in me this extraordinary sense of radical love for people. I don't like to see suffering. Um, I come from a lineage of people who have lived under one of the longest standing military occupations in modern history. And I know that struggle. I've li- I went, I visited my grandparents, you know, my family, and that's what I grew up with. I grew up with this idea of like, I have a responsibility um, uh, in a way that um, just informs everything that I do. So today, I just really want to talk about some of the basic ideas behind your book. And I want to spend some time for our listeners and the folks who are watching right now, Um, to really get a sense of who you are and how you came to be. So first, I'd like to just ask you, tell us about what inspired you to write this book. I know you don't have oodles of time on your hands to be writing books as you're organizing Muslim communities across the country, leading marches of millions and millions of people, you know, organizing to make sure that your communities and my communities have not only the basic necessities that we need, but also have the power that we deserve. What inspired you to write this book? Um, you know, just like you, Alicia, I don't have much time. And it actually took me about two and a half years to write this book. Uh, and the reason why I wrote this book is that I felt um, that I owed it to my family and I owed it to my community. A lot of what people know about uh, the people that I come from, the neighborhoods that I grew up in, you know, the leaders that have mentored me, about my family, about my children, and about me as, an, as a person is all framed by others. It's all framed by media. It's all framed by oppositional groups. Um, and it and and our community deserves to tell our own story. So this is this book really is a love letter to my children. You know, my children have had to unfortunately experience and read such horrific things about their mom, but they know who I am. And so for me, I wanted to give my children something tangible, something to hold and say, this is our story. This is your mother's story. And my book really is a story that. I focused on making sure that it wasn't a victim story of a victim. I'm not a victim uh, in this country uh, of hate. I am a survivor of of, of religious intolerance, of of bigotry, of xenophobia, of of all forms of of, of racism um, that I've experienced. Um, You know, I mean, not all forms of racism, but the types of racism that I've seen, whether it be like you said on Twitter, or whether it be a form of hate mail or the form of being doxxed online and put have my address public or even death threats or or other uh, horror that I've experienced. But my book really, I try not to really tell a lot of those stories because I wanted my book to be one of victory and empowerment and like, look, things happen like this. I'm not, I'm not, this is not exclusive to me. This is unfortunately the history of this country. Anyone who stands up and is a truth teller and stands by their convictions uh, and fights with everything that they have and are willing to risk everything are always going to be attacked and vilified. And so this book is really a love letter to my community that says, we're going to get through this. We're going to win. And I'm willing to take whatever hits along the way that it requires uh, for us to get there. That's beautiful. You know, I poured through your book page by page, and one of the things that just really struck me is how profound the stories are that you tell and the lessons that you've learned. And the first thing I thought about was, you know, you start to tell the story of the first time that you put on the hijab. 
And it is a beautiful story that is also deeply interwoven with um, what I think people don't fully understand about um, your faith or about women in your community. So I'm wondering if you can just start us off by talking a little bit about that moment and you make this statement in the book, right, that there's these contradictions around feminism and how it is that we, um, you know, either assign or celebrate feminism in some contexts, and we assume that there is the absence of feminism in other contexts. So can you tell us a little bit? First, I'd like you to tell our listeners that story because it's incredibly powerful. But if you could also just talk a little bit about those contradictions and help our, our viewers understand, you know, why is it that Muslim women are denied um, the opportunity to identify as feminists and what's wrong with that? I appreciate that. I mean, that was one, a very important chapter in my book to be able to write about. And the book is, uh, the chapter is actually um, uh, called The Choice I Made. And, that, and it's specific, and I was very deliberate about using this idea of choice um, and how choice shows up in the feminist movement. And unfortunately, it, it seems to me that in many sections of our feminist movement, choice is only for some and not for everyone. And uh, for me, immediately after the Women's March, I became a living contradiction um, and feminists had to come to terms with me. You know, could it, could it be true that a Muslim American woman, one that wears hijab that covers her body that is modest, could in fact be a feminist, like what's going on here? I mean, we went from a country that was, you know, targeting Muslims in the post 9-11 era to January 21st of 2017, millions of women across the country were holding up a poster that was of a Muslim woman wearing the American flag hijab. And that became the symbol of resistance to fascism in America. And for some, it just blew their mind. And that, that particular poster, is really what triggered a lot of the right wing to me because I was the symbol of the women's march that was the woman in the hijab and people associated with, with me with that poster. And somehow I became this quote, symbolic kind of, uh, uh, or the symbol of the resistance in America. And that's how I believe that kind of attacks kind of um, uh, started. And women were, were saying to me, you know, and trying to give me examples as, you know, white liberal women in particular saying, you know, wait a minute, how could you be wearing a hijab and claim to be in solidarity with women in Iran who are being forced to wear hijabs. And so for a lot of liberal white women in particular, there's this absolutism, there's no nuance, there's no opportunity for there to be, there's always the black and white, it's either this or that. There's no area for us to really have these deep conversations. And so in my book, I was very clear about saying, if you are going to be a feminist, feminism is also about consistency. And for me, this hijab is my choice. And I grew up, as many folks know, my, my name that I was born with is Linda. Um, it's not very Muslim name. Um, I, I grew up, I was born and raised in Brooklyn. I had this, like, I was like Linda with this Brooklyn accent. So a lot of people thought I was Puerto Rican when I didn't wear hijab. And a lot of people, and I talk about this in my book, like if you are a black woman, you have beautiful black skin that you could kind of grow into and be proud of. I didn't have anything about my identity and the way I physically looked that I could say it's my identity. I was so ambiguous to people. And it really, for me, left a hole. And so this hijab gave me something. It gave me something that at least when I walk down the street, you may not know I'm Palestinian. You may not know I'm a daughter of immigrants. You may not know I'm born in Brooklyn, but you, don't, you do know that I'm a Muslim. And that was very important to me. And one of the main reasons why I wore the hijab and so for me in my book, this idea of giving our Muslim woman like me the idea that this is an agency, this is a choice that I made, and that for feminists to be consistent, to say, Look, we could be outraged at a country like Iran who forces women to wear hijab, but we could also be outraged at countries like France, a Western democracy, that does not allow women like me to wear hijab in public university. I'm not allowed to get a public sector job in a place like France. I can't even wear a long sleeve bathing suit in, on a beach in France. So the question then becomes, can you be a feminist and hold these two things and say both are wrong? Can you look at me and say, she's my sister. She chooses to wear a hijab. And I, and, I, and I believe in her choice and her agency to do that, just as I believe in the agency for women to not wear hijab. And as you know, Alicia, for many of our friends, a lot of our Muslim sisters don't wear hijab. And guess what? That's cool. And I'm not more Muslim than them because I decided to wear a hijab. This hijab for me is... Is, is, a, is a physical 
a connection that I have with my faith, with my identity and with God. And for other people, they define it in different ways. And so I just want people to allow me to define it, allow Muslim women to define it and to see us not less than because we decide to wear a cloth on our head. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really interesting because you hit this point so many times about having the agency and the self-determination to be able to speak for ourselves on our own behalf. And to me, you know, as somebody who has been in this movement with you for a long time, um, it seems to me that that is the thing that we're fighting for, right? It's not just healthcare or the economy or, you know, um, closing the wage gap. It is very much the ability to be able to tell our own stories on our own terms and to have those stories be rich and complex. You tell a bunch of rich and complex stories in your book that really kind of talk about how you got involved in active in activism. So I want to talk about that. But before I do, um, one of the stories that you told that was very rich and complex, and it really actually broke my heart, was the story about um, Palestine. And, you know, for some, this is a topic that is fraught with a lot of tensions. As we know, uh, the conflict um, between Israel and Palestine is, is older than us, <laughs> right? And um, yet we continue to kind of be in this cycle of um, demonization, but also not allowing each other to tell our stories on our own terms and to determine our futures for ourselves based on what's best for us and our families and also based on what's best for us together. My question to you, Linda, um, is, you know, it is true that when we look at a map, um, we don't see the word Palestine. Um, and you just talked to me about how difficult, right, it is to walk through America and have people place their stories on you um, with no agency of your own. Can you talk a little bit about how that experience shaped you, right? So looking at a map and not seeing the place where your family comes from, um, and then being told by your classmates, right, that you come from nowhere and that basically you don't exist, even though you're actually sitting right there in physical proximity. Um, can you talk to us about what that does? What does that do to other Palestinian children in this country who um, have this rich and complex story to tell, but we've created this context where there is no, no, no dynamic, no, no symbol even for us to tell the stories of how we even got here in the first place. Can you talk a little bit about what that's doing um, to our collective culture here in, in the United States? Sometimes I just want to be able to tell someone that I'm Palestinian and that kind of be the end of the conversation and just sit, kind of move on. Just when you ask someone where you're from and they say, oh, my family is originally from the Dominican Republic or Puerto Rican or, uh, you know, from, you know, Zimbabwe or from Iran or whatever the country is that your family comes from for those of us who are children of immigrants. And that usually is the end of the conversation when you ask that to someone. For some reason, when someone asks us as Palestinians, you know, where is your family from? And you say from Palestine, all of a sudden people go into a different mindset and they say, oh, I don't want to talk about politics. And my thing is like, why can't I just be a human being that comes from a place? You know, why can't Palestine just be a homeland, um, be a place of culture and of music and of food and of something that I'm connected to? So what has happened is that Palestinians in general have become politicized. Um, I don't have to say anything. Just the idea of being Palestinian is a, a politicization and it's seen as somehow contradictory to someone else's story. That just me existing in the world, just me breathing in the world, just me saying I'm a proud and unapologetic Palestinian somehow is contradictory and is a threat to someone else's story. And what I say to people all the time, as you know, it's it, being Palestinian is really a lot of the, the center of the controversies I find myself in is that why can't I be? Why can't there be two stories? Why? Why does my story have to negate someone else's story? You know, I tell people all the time, like you can't take away my grandparents' story. Like my grandmother was born in 1927 in Palestine. That was 21 years before the creation of the state of Israel. 
what happens to her story? Does her story get deleted? Is, does her story not matter? Is there no space for the story of my grandmother who coexisted with Christians and Jews and Muslims in Palestine many, many years before there was a state of Israel? And that's for me, my work and my responsibility, as my parents put it, is to continue to invoke my story. My existence is resistance. Um, it's resistance to this idea that somehow we're going to delete the story of Palestine off the face of the earth, that we're just going to act like this never happened. These, uh, these young people are going to eventually forget. My children are second generation Palestinian American. Their mother is an American. They are American. They're born in Brooklyn. You know, my kids' social media, sometimes it brings tears to my eyes when I watch my kids on social media, like post stuff. And some of their bios say things like, Palestinian by blood, you know, like they're so proud to be Palestinian, although they are two generations removed. There's something about this, um, this being part of a, of a, of a lineage of oppression, of a lineage that someone keeps telling you you're less than, you know, you, you've heard these terms used about Palestinian savages, you know, somehow we don't know how to govern ourselves, which is why we're under occupation. We need someone to rule us because we're so unruly people. But in fact, Palestinians are people with dreams and aspirations. We want to live freely. We want to go to school. We want our families there just want to live. They just want to live and they want to coexist. Um, there's a lot of uh, unfortunate um, stories that are told about, like if you go to the streets of Palestine, you've been Alicia, there's no one in Palestine that you're going to go up to and is going to be like, we want all these people out of here. They just want to live with dignity. They want to have opportunities to work and send their kids to and make their kids road scholars and send them to be Fulbrights. And they have so much aspiration. And that, and for me, that's what I symbolize. I'm not going to stop being unapologetically Palestinian because I not only, not only do I owe it to my parents who struggled and immigrated to this country for a better life for me, I owe it to my grandmothers and my great, great, great grandmothers. And, you know, I, and, and, and as you know, just from being in, in, in a lot of our communities, like our young people are still proud. And it does hurt our psychology. Like when I have to explain to young kids that I've, in my own community, I've had summer camps and I've led summer camps at my organization, the Arab American Association of New York, and having to explain and say, say it's not about a map or a piece of paper, because there's someone who has power over that piece of paper that was drawn with this map. You know, someone uh, has power over this globe and the way that it was formed and who gets to be on the globe. But Palestine is not just a place, it's, some, it's in your heart and that you have a responsibility to carry it there. And that is why you have so much Palestinian in the diaspora who are still so unapologetic and why the diaspora has continued to stand in solidarity with the Palestinian people. Mm -hmm. That's powerful. I mean, we are in such, um, I don't wanna keep using these weird buzzwords that everybody uses, like we're in such unprecedented times. <laughs> but we are um, living through something that most of us have not lived through before. And as you do, I often get these questions of like, how did you become the leader of a movement? <laughs> and I, I always feel like it's really important to demystify for people. Um, what happens when that light bulb turns on? And how does the light bulb turning on translate into somebody who was going about their life doing their thing actually making a decision that changing this country for the better is their primary mission. So Linda, could you walk people through, how did you go from just being a dope homegirl from Brooklyn <laughs> um, to you know, leading all of these incredible movements that have literally changed the landscape of this country? I appreciate that. Um, I always tell people um, this was never the choice that I was making in my life. I was actually an aspiring high school English teacher. I watched this movie called Dangerous Minds with Michelle Pfeiffer. And I was like, that's going to be me. I'm going to go back to like my old high school and I'm going to inspire these young people of color. And I'm going to tell them that I love them and embrace them and, you know, give them uh, literature and give them opportunities to express themselves. That was literally my whole dream of my life. And then um, the horrific attacks of 9-11 happened and I was a college student. And as many people know, you know, we, our generation has lived through a lot and 9-11 was um, one of those uh, moments. And, you know, I lived in New York City. I'm born and raised here in New York City. And we were all horrified. We were all impacted as New Yorkers and we were all impacted across the world. And then something else happened. 
um, being a Muslim American uh, in, in New York City was for the first time that my identity became at the forefront of who I was. And I didn't never really realize that. I literally was walking around Brooklyn with a hijab for about a year and a half before 9-11. No one really looked at me twice because that was the beauty, beauty of New York City, just the diversity. And I also lived in a community where a lot of people looked like me. And so that day when 9-11 happened, you know, there was no Twitter, there was no Facebook, there was no flat screen TVs in your college campus where you can kind of figure out what was going on. Um, small numbers of people had cell phones. So you really, it wasn't like how it is. Nobody could text you. There was nothing going on. And I walked home from my college campus for about two and a half hours until I got to the streets of the community that I was born in. And I saw all the Muslim businesses closed. I saw the mosque doors bolted. And I was like, what is going on here? What's the problem? Got to my mom's house who was watching my children while I was in school and sat down in front of that TV. Um, and before I actually sat down in front of the TV, my mom was running out of the house and I share that in my book. And I'm like, yo lady, where are you going? You don't have your hijab on. And my mom's like, we can't get married right now and whispering. I was like, what's this thing going on? And so when I got inside, of course, I sat in front of the TV with my son who was about two years old. And he was like, mommy, look, the fire, fire. And I was watching the the cyclical of, you know, um, imagery that we see now where the kind of towers are falling. And I'm, I'm like, oh my God. And then from there, um, immediately after that horrific attack, I live in the, one of the most highly concentrated Muslim communities in New York City. And the things that I witnessed, um, Alicia, with my own eyes are not things that I expected to see in this country. I knew there was injustice. I wasn't naive. I went to a very diverse high school. I went to an, almost an all black high school. I had great teachers who really taught us a lot about history um, and I understood injustice. Um, but I didn't expect to still see the things that I did. I mean, I witnessed um, as a 21 year old, uh, men being dragged out of buildings and being told to lay out on the sidewalks. I watched children in the windows crying for their parents on the street. And these are not things that I was expecting to experience in my country and particularly not to my community. Um, and as a young mom at the time, I was really triggered. Like these are little kids, toddlers watching their fathers on the street. Some of them getting taken into like these unmarked vans and unmarked cars. And um, I remember going to the mosque about a week or two later, like a Friday. And I remember just these women walking in crying and saying, they took my husband, they took my husband. This other one was like, they took my son. And I went to the Imam, who's our religious leader at the mosque. And it was the saddest thing that I've ever seen where he looked at me, he was an immigrant from Egypt and he looked at me, he said, what am I supposed to do? He said, I came to America, I thought this was the land of freedom. I thought this was the place where these things don't happen. And I became a translator and that, that's how my initial kind of, um, kind of journey came. And I became a translator for women and I was so, it was funny cause I was like so, uh, I was used to be so upset with my parents cause they used to uh, force us to only speak Arabic at home. We were not allowed to speak English at home. And I used to be really resentful of that. My mom was like, well, if you want to speak English, you can do that at school or we'll do that with your friends outside. But in this house, we speak Arabic. And here I was, 21 years old, fluent in Arabic, being able to translate for women in my community. And so for me, the, the, the response to 9-11, the attacks on my community, the targeting, the physical targeting of my community was that radicalizing moment for me. I was like, this is not all right. This is not okay. I'm not going to allow this to happen. I'm, I'm going to do something about it, even though I did not know what I was going to do. And for me, translation, going into detention centers, locating husbands, um, sons. And that was like, then my, that's where my journey started. I just, it kind of, I just kind of never looked back. And I feel like I'm having that same feeling right now during this epidemic. Um, and that feeling you get when you, to your point, when you feel like, you know, how does your journey start or where do you like, how is it not the same anymore? You can't go back and being just that homegirl from Brooklyn. That's how I felt after 9-11. And I'm also feeling that right now in this epidemic. I don't know how you can sit here with this epidemic, knowing our people don't have health care, knowing that a majority of people that are dying are poor people and people of color and particularly black people. And you can just walk out of this pandemic being the same person again. I'm not the same person, even not the same person I was after 9-11 and the organizing that I did. There's just something that happens to your inside that says to you, and really the why I wrote the title of my book, like you are not here to be a bystander. Like that's just not why you're here. And I think all, all of us have that in us. None of us are here to watch homelessness or watch injustice and just sit around and be like, this must just be how it is, which is what a lot of people in our country have done for a really long time for good reason and valid reasons where they feel like there's just no hope. It's been like this for 400 years. Some will say 260 years. I have this belief in, of a potential of our country. I believe in our country. I believe in us. I believe in Alicia. And I believe in the leadership of Black women and women of color that, yes, when Black women are free and they are in leadership, we will all be free. And that is what I'm committed to in the work that I do. And that is those are the radicalizing moments that I share, actually, in my book that started with the horrific attacks of 9-11. But there were many moments later where I was re-radicalized and refueled to continue to do this work. 
You know, I'm glad you used this word radicalized um, because I think in a post 9-11 context, the word radicalized has, um, it has become supercharged uh, by the same forces, right? Who really drove Islamophobia and, um, you know, violence and attacks against Muslim communities really to kind of obscure uh, what I think were important geopolitical dynamics mm -hmm. around, um, you know, using a terrible, terrible, terrible tragedy uh, to be opportunist, right? And take advantage of um, grabbing power in a region that had resources that the United States wanted and needed. Um, radicalization really, right? If we're just to like get to the root of it, <laughs> as our sister Angela Davis would say, is literally just that moment where the light bulb goes on that um, everything that we have been told about um, how things function and how they're supposed to function and whose fault it is if they don't function the way that we were told they're supposed to function. Um, it's that moment when that light bulb goes on and you actually um, see what's underneath, right? And it spurs you to take action. Radicalization is not um, limited, right, to Muslim communities. It's not limited to Arab communities, but yet, and Muslim and Arab communities are not interchangeable. But yet, the ways in which we talk about consciousness raising, the ways in which we talk about um, the dynamic that Fannie Lou Hamer felt, right, where she said, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired, um, that dynamic, right, is again, allowed for some and not allowed for others. And the reason that I just kind of situated radicalization in that context with you in particular, Linda, um, is that you have been a bullseye target um, for what I would call the extreme racist right. And I think as collateral damage, right? Um, people who have different values, um, have also attacked you, <laughs> just to be 100%. And I, I, I use this context because I do. I think it's important to keep emphasizing the ways in which the stories that we tell shape our understanding of how the world functions. It shapes our understanding of who belongs and who doesn't belong. It shapes our understanding of who's deserving and who's not deserving. And um, that's important because um, when we get into this project of trying to make right what has been wrong for so long, um, there is a strategy uh, that um, uh, our opposition uses, right, to divide and conquer. And you have been at the intersection of that. And I have seen it personally. I've witnessed it personally, um, where literally something very basic that you can say, like, um, you know, Palestinian people deserve to be free, or, um, you know, well, very basic shared values, right, get misconstrued, and actually in a very, very dangerous way. Um, do you remember the first time, Linda, that you were targeted by the racist right? And if so, can you talk to us about that? And as a follow-up question, I do want to ask, because your book is so clear, right, about how scary it is and also the resilience that you've been able to generate that makes you a badass leader. <laughs> so I'm wondering if you can talk about the first time you were ever targeted by the right and how did you find the power inside of yourself and in your community to be resilient and even more unabashed in the face of those really, really terrible attacks. So my first brush in with um, the right wing was really um, right wing Zionist way before the Women's March. Just again, I was Palestinian. So it wasn't really much. I would get a little article here and there. There's a woman in New York that many people uh, know uh, was the woman behind a lot of the controversy around the ground, what they called the Ground Zero Mosque that happened around 2010, where the Muslim American community wanted to buy this building. And apparently to the right wing, it was too close in proximity to uh, the World Trade Center or Ground Zero. And that was a big controversy. So I went head to head with the woman who was kind of behind a lot of that. 
Um, she also had put up ads um, across New York City subways and buses that were like anti-Muslim. So again, I went up up against her, and of course, her friends, uh, you know, wanted to defend her. So I, I I was like brushing with it. It was cool. I was like, okay, fine. You know, this is not great, but I get it. But the real attacks that I received um, that were really unprecedented um, were immediately, and I'm talking about immediately as in like 24 hours after the Women's March on Washington. And there was nothing new that happened. There was nothing about me that there was nothing that I said, or it was really that the people in opposition to us, as you know, the, uh, the far right was not really, didn't really know what to expect from what the Women's March was gonna end up being. And when they saw, you know, that we were able to bring out um, over three and a half million people, women and allies across the country, and of course, six million worldwide. It was beyond really our expectations and their expectations. And so immediately, what they thought would be the weakest link um, of the four of us was me as a Muslim. They thought that if they went after the Muslim woman, that somehow she would be like kind of removed um, out of out of the way. And and so for me, they went after me. Oh my God! Immediately on using Palestine and as you know, the kind of weaponization of anti-Semitism that I've experienced um, mostly, uh, they went after me because of my hijab, basically saying that I was a religious fundamentalist. Um, I had uh, worked in the past on campaigns fighting anti-Sharia laws in, in cities across the country and states across the country, which are really just bills put forth by Republicans to kind of limit the right of Muslims to practice their religion freely, and they call them anti-Sharia laws. And so they just kind of started pulling out things left and right. They went back to like my Twitter account from like 10 years ago. The usual things that you see they do in cancel culture um, and, 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 and kind of moved on from there. The thing about me the reason why I've been able, been able to have this result. And then so from that, it was like immediate death threats, um, immediate uh, doxing, put out my home address. And you know how it is, like I'm in New York City, like I can't afford to just pick up my kids and move. Like that's just not how this works, right? I don't have the type of resources to be able to do that. So you dox me, I'm probably gonna still be living in the house that you doxed me in. Um, they doxed my parents. My parents are elderly people, like leave my family alone. It was really scary stuff, obviously in every major newspaper from the low, you know, from the right wing rags all the way to the mainstream. And I was really fortunate to have had to to have like the backing of the movement. I mean, I've had at the, immediately after the Women's March, you know, celebrities and my allies and organizations and organizers really came out for me. Why? Because I tell people that before there was ever a Women's March, I spent the last 20 years of my life building relationships, showing up, doing the work. You know, this is not the Women's March for me. And something that makes me sad about it is that people like me and Carmen and Tamika, like we've been out here doing this work. Like we, like and the fact that people only sometimes remember us by the Women's March just tells you and reinforces the narratives we always talk about, Alicia, which is the erasure of the work of women of color and the work that we've always been doing. But when we teamed up with white women and it became the Women's March on Washington and we're doing this big thing, all of a sudden people now knew who we were. And it was scary for me in the, like when it first happens, you're like, oh my God, like what, like how could, how could all this hate be targeted at this one woman at me? Like, I'm not a threat. Like I, I, you may not agree with me and you could all vehemently disagree with me, but like, why would you want to kill me? Why would you be invoking like things like rape against my daughters? How did you know I had daughters? Like things like that. One of the things um, that has kept me going, and it's something that I tell people, and it scares people when I say this, because um, they, they, people want to like know how to, how did I get here? But I'm actually not afraid to die. I really am not, and because of that, I continue to go back out, back out, back out, and continue to do the work. And if, if a consequence means I'm going to lose my life for it, I have come to terms with that. I also, like you, Alicia, and many women of color in our movements, like I have little Muslim girls that look up to me and two of those Muslim girls are my daughters. I am not going to cower. I'm not going to be afraid because when I'm afraid, they will be afraid. And the idea here is that our leadership is not just about us. It's about the type of, of, of how we show up to give and instill hope and courage in others to show up for themselves. So when I walk out of my home in an unapologetic it allows other girls and organizers and women in my community to be unapologetic. As you notice, there are hundreds and hundreds of Muslim organizers across the country, but there are many women who will tell you that I'm doing the work, but I don't wanna be in the media. I don't wanna be the one on the mic. I don't wanna be at the rally because they are afraid to, for them to experience the things that I've experienced. A lot of people will also say about me that, you know, and, and to your point about using the word radicalization, I use all those words. I'm radical and I'm proud of it. Um, and one, one other word I used in my book, and people thought I was crazy for starting there, but the introduction to my book is called, What is Your Jihad? 
And people were like, oh my God, Linda, you know, you're always being so provocative. And I said, provocative to who? Who gets provocative in comparison to what? And so what they really mean to say is that this is provocative to white folks, right? And people in the, oftentimes in the far right who have heard words through propaganda like jihad and like radical and radicalization that has been used by American law enforcement and government to talk about the radicalization of young people towards terrorism and things like that. And I'm in, I'm in the business of reclaiming language. Radical, it means to get to the root of the problem. And that's what I'm doing every single day of my life. I started my my introduction with what is your jihad because jihad means struggle and I as a Muslim American I as a fluent Arabic speaker jihad is an Arabic word I should be able to define that word Muslim should be able to define that word and for too long we have allowed the far right to define sharia to define uh you know jihad to define all these words that belong to us and are in fact always defined wrong how do you get to define a word that's not even in your in your language? Like it just doesn't make sense to me. So for me, it's it's about breaking through a narrative that has been offered to my community. Everyone says, "Here's the box, and I need you to fit yourself into this box." And I'm like, "No. First of all, not only do I want to be outside, not do I want to color outside the lines you gave me. I don't even want the box at all. You put that box to the side. I'm I want to start something different." So for me, that has really helped my community. Like, for example, when I got into the controversy about jihad, which was during a Muslim convention, I shared a story of our beloved Prophet Muhammad. I used the word jihad. Some organization took the, by the way, public video. This wasn't like a secret conversation with the Muslims. They, you know, as they, as you know what they do, they edit it, put it together. They splice it really nicely. And next thing you know, Donald Trump Jr. is saying that I'm calling for a holy war on the president of the United States of America. And, you know, and the attacks went crazy. Like that was the, the jihad one was a really bad one. They were like, I should be hanged. I should be arrested for treason and things like that. And when I, I call, you know, the Washington, I called the Washington Post. I was like, look, everybody's talking about me without me. Like, this is not how this is supposed to work. It's, it's time for me to talk and, and defend myself. And I wrote an op-ed um, in the Washington Post that ended up being called, um, I am every Islamophobe's worst nightmare, which is where that comes from. And, um, and in that, I double down. I double down on my right in this country, my religious right to practice my faith freely, um, to be able to use the words for my faith, just like, you know, and basically saying like, look, we, Muslims don't tell anyone else how to practice their faith. Why are folks always trying to tell us how to practice our faith? And from there, um, Alicia, something amazing happened. These Muslim scholars in my community and young people in my community, they all went out publicly writing op-eds, talking to the media about what jihad means to them. They had a trending hashtag, my jihad, talking about, you know, my jihad is, you know, uh, trying to pass my final exams in college. You know, my jihad is trying to find a harmonious relationship with my loved one. You know, my jihad is, you know, ensuring that I get accepted to law school. I mean, jihad could really mean any type of internal struggle that we're having with ourselves or with our loved ones or even in our community. And so for me, my resilience comes from like getting knocked down and getting back up, getting knocked down and getting back up. And my skin is just so thick that there's nothing that moves me. I mean, sometimes our friends will send me something they saw on social media. They would be horrified by it. Like one time a friend of ours sent me a photo that they saw on someone's Instagram. That was a picture of me with my head chopped off, literally. And it didn't move me at all. It just doesn't. And I know that that's sad and that's something potentially that I really need to address. Like, how could I be so numb to this type of violence and to this type of targeting? Uh, but, you know, God's got me through it and my community has got me through it. And the last thing that I'll say also about me is that I come from a people like in the United States of America, like I come from a community, like my community is not going to let me fall. So they can vilify me. They've demonized me in every single way possible but my community always got my back. I never have to worry about, you know, quote, quote unquote, being canceled um, because the people that I love and that I fight for, they're not, they're never going to cancel me because they see my sacrifice and they see my passion. And I, I, and I will say to folks who are worried about being canceled or think that saying the truth is going to get you canceled. This book is just really, for me, a manifestation of what it looks like when you, when you stand by your convictions, like for God's sake, Simon and Schuster is one of the largest publishing firms in the world. And they were like, this spicy lady right here, come over here we're going to get you a book deal and you're going to write a book and tell your story. And that just tells a lot that my story is important. Your story is important. And I can't wait to read your book um, one day very soon that our stories are also archives of history. Like this book, I may not be here. I may be here for the next, I may live for 50 years. I may live for 20. I may live maybe not till next week. I don't know. But what I do know is the story is going to live and it's going to be in the hands of little Muslim girls and Muslim boys and people 
um, who are just going to need one last message of like, get up. Like, is, is it bad? It's bad, but your people, you know, are counting on you. And for me, I also say that the thing that moves me is really not hope. Um, and I think that's an important thing because people always ask us like, what keeps you, you know, it, for me, it's not hope, it's love. And I always say to people, if you love, if you think about someone that you love, right, your mom, your dad, maybe your siblings, maybe your partner, maybe, you know, your grandma or, or you know, just in general, people that you just love that may not be your blood relatives. That's what I think about every day. And so every time I'm like, this is just, let me just find some other life to live or some other job. And then I think about my kids and I'm like, I love them too much um, to stop, to, to, to be afraid and to not continue the work that I do. So when you're feeling down, when you're feeling like this, is, you don't want to kind of move forward, just always think about somebody that you love. And I promise you, you'll get right back up. You know what? Yes. Yes. So um, I have a zillion more questions, but we are coming up on audience question time and I don't want to be selfish because we know each other in real life. So I want to make sure we give people who don't know you in real life a chance to ask you questions. But I am going to take interviewer privilege and ask you one more question. Um, let me just say this book is excellent. And I am not I'm going to walk you through every single chapter of this book. But Linda talks a lot about coming up in New York City her experiences with the criminal justice system and, you know, just coming to consciousness around what needs to be changed and then the struggles that she has had to go through in order to be a change maker. Um, there's so much to talk about in terms of, you know, what was it like being the co-founder and leader of the Women's March, all that stuff. But what I want to spend our last few minutes together talking about is what you're working on now, because um, you are literally unstoppable. Look at you building like the largest civic engagement organization in the country, mobilizing, activating, and engaging Muslim communities um, in democracy. You're also, you know, out here just like making things happen. So can you talk to folks about what are you doing right now and how can they support your work? Oh my God, I appreciate that so much. Um, I co-founded an organization called M Power Change. So it's the letter M, which stands for Muslim, but didn't want to scare folks, just kidding. M Power Change. Um, M Power Change is committed to um, inclusive democracy and one that includes the voices of Muslim Americans. And our signature campaign right now that we're working on is uh, My Muslim Vote. And it's really about encouraging Muslim Americans across the country to engage in the political process on, and teaching them that all politics is local. And so we are committed to that campaign. We are um, have a, a big digital kind of operation. So we're able to do peer to peer texting. We're able to help people uh, get their absentee ballots and really doing a lot of political education within the Muslim American community. And I'm very proud of that work. And um, we are also a 501c organization as well as a C4. So we're able to do some political advocacy and organizing, which believe it or not, there are not many C4 Muslim-led organizations in the country. And I'm very proud of that work and the team that we have at Empower Change. Um, so we would love for you to support our work there. Uh, I'm also actually working on um, the Young Readers edition of my book. Um, so I believe that you're never too young to be radicalized um, and to be taught of your worth uh, and also not only of your worth, but of your power. And so I'm working on a Young Readers edition that will be for kind of like for ages, maybe like fourth, fifth grade to maybe seventh grade. Uh, so I'm working on that right now. Um, and I'm also, as you know, working with um, a group of folks at a group called Until Freedom that mostly works with formerly incarcerated people, um, really focused on looking at where are the hot spots around COVID and what kind of accountability can we put forth and what does it look like for us to show up for incarcerated people, especially in kind of a digital era where we're kind of quarantined. Um, so helping people and putting information in the hands of like, who are the leaders of the local bureaus of prisons that they should be contacting and really putting those voices out. So we've done one recently, kind of a webinar that's not just about what are the conditions? And I think people know the conditions of our prisons in America, which are absolutely abhorrent and oftentimes engage in things like torture, like solitary confinement, which is basically some of the things that people are doing uh, for folks who may be sick. They're actually putting them in solitary confinement, which really defeats the purpose of humanity. But anyway, 
So kind of always finding my like leg in right now, I'm working with Adi and a couple of other folks on just trying to amplify work around the second wave of stimulus um, and making sure that people have the information, call your members of Congress. Being home for me, just to end with this is really hard. I'm an organizer. Um, uh, I like the streets. That's just who I am. Um, I like to knock on doors. I like to be with people. I like to be in space with people. So I'm having a hard time finding ways to be productive um, outside of social media, um, but I think all of us can find that um, productivity. And so empower change really for me, we have to win this election. There's nothing in my mind that tells me that we, we, we can't find creative ways to get our people to the polls, protect our people at the polls and make sure that we defeat this demagogue, this fascist who has wreaked havoc on our communities um, and has taken marginalized people even farther into the margins. And so that's what I'm committed to over the next few months. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, so we are moving into the um, audience portion of this. If we were in person, um, you all would be lining up at a mic and handing me questions on stage that I'd be flipping through on the index cards being like, yes, this, no, this. Um, mm -hmm. But we're going to do this a little bit differently today. Um, and I've got a whole list of questions for you, Linda. And this was one that I wanted to ask you too. So selfishly, I'm going to start with this one. Um, this is from Peter. Peter asks, can you both talk about the 2020 election? After Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders dropped from the race, many young people are discouraged at the idea of voting for Joe Biden. What are your opinions on voting blue no matter who? <laughs> wow. You definitely went there, Peter, didn't you? Um, I don't think it's just young people, Peter. And I think that we need to be really honest about this conversation so that we're able to be creative about going forward. Um, so some the messaging that I may be using right now may not be for everyone, um, but I know it's going to work for the people that I'm trying to organize. So this is what I this is how I'm showing up in this 2020 election. I'm absolutely horror. Like I, it's like a horror show right now to know that we had two brilliant leaders like Elizabeth Warren and Senator Bernie Sanders who are giving us a vision forward, who are literally telling us what life was going to be like the fight, the life that we were going to fight for after a Trump administration, you know, they, they were giving us a lot of hope and aspirations and made us feel worthy with the, with the types of platforms that we saw ourselves in. And now we end up with Joe Biden and with um, Donald Trump. And what I'm telling people um, in order to encourage them to stay, uh, you know, uh, keep their head in the game, as they say, is all politics is local and find yourself a young person of color, an immigrant, you know, someone from a marginalized community, a young progressive who's running in your area, running for state legislator, running for a city council seat, running for Congress, uh, someone running for the Senate and put all your energy that you had on someone like Senator Bernie Sanders or Senator Warren and put your love and energy in those campaigns. And I promise you what's going to happen is that when you put your energy um, and your passion into a campaign and the local campaign, it increases voter turnout and by default, we went up and down the ballot because when people go to the ballot, they usually go up and down the ballot. Right. So I don't like this whole thing. Vote blue, no matter who. Um, it just doesn't work. And people tried that in 2016. And as you know, it didn't work. And I'm not trying to play that again. Uh, the thing that I'm doing on the presidential level, particularly for people who I'm, I'm mobilizing in swing states, and I'm focusing specifically on Muslim Americans in Michigan and Ohio and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania and Virginia and Florida and Texas and Colorado and Nevada, is what I'm saying to them is like, this may be, this is maybe the question that we should be asking. Who do you want your opponent to be in the White House? Do you want your opponent opponent to be a demagogue fascist, or do you want your opponent to be someone that you vehemently disagree with, who has someone who's someone who has made grave mistakes in their past, and that you can push forward, that we could build a movement around and kind of push and continue to push. And one example that I'll give is that during the tenure of Donald Trump, I worked on a bipartisan no no war resolution in a bipartisan Senate. That means Republicans and Democrats who, who, who passed a no war resolution on Yemen. And imagine that no one thought we could do it. And then it gets to the, to the desk of the president and the president vetoes it. So the question would be, would I be able to pass a no war resolution in a bipartisan Senate and send it to the desk of Joe Biden? I would imagine that we had, we would be able to build the type of political will that he would need to push these things forward. I also think, think about the Supreme Court. And I'm not willing to give up the Supreme Court. Our black people, poor people, immigrants, Muslim communities, a lot, LGBTQIA folks, we need that Supreme Court. Sometimes that's the only remedy we have for equality and justice and making sure that the constitution um, applies to us. 
I'm not ready to give it up. Um, we almost gave it all up um, in 2016. So that's kind of how I'm talking to people about this. I'm not excited, um, but I also understand this, what's at stake and what's at in, in danger. And right now in New York City and in many cities across the country, there are such amazing people running for office. Please find one, put your money on them, organize, make sure you go to the polls. And when you get there, close your eyes and just go up and down the ballot. Um, but, but it has to be something that inspires you. And I think the local candidates with the local policy platforms are what's going to inspire voters to go to the polls. Yes, um, Peter, I could not agree more with my sister, Linda. And, you know, the reality is that um, they're not our friends. <laughs> and for those of us who, um, you know, I, I think a lot of us have been trained to engage in elections like we choose our favorite reality star. And the thing is, um, that's not democracy. And it's certainly not the democracy that we, you know, are struggling to hold on to in this country. And um, one of the things that I know Linda and I both know about being in movements is that and there are going to be many times of these kinds of heartbreaks. I know I was all in for Elizabeth Warren. Linda is all in for Senator Bernie Sanders. And the reality is, right, like our hearts are broken too. And when I turn on the television and I'm trying to get news about what are we supposed to do in the midst of a global pandemic, and I see this man who's supposed to be our leader, I think about oh my God, we missed the biggest opportunity ever to have somebody like Bernie Sanders leading us or have somebody like Elizabeth Warren leading us, somebody who's so coherent and has a vision and makes sense. But that's not where we're at. But we cannot lose uh, sight of the fact that that is still where we are trying to go. Yes. This is not about choosing the person who you would have over for dinner. Um, a lot of these people who run this country are not people I would have in my house over dinner. These are people who we are choosing to push our agenda forward. And frankly, we still have a lot of time to um, make the Democratic candidates um, accountable to our communities. And elections are literally, in a lot of ways, litmus tests. They're not political litmus tests. They are litmus tests for how many people we can organize to our side. And so we have an opportunity to demonstrate that our values are majoritarian values at the ballot box. And Linda is 100% right. If the president don't do it for you, cool. You know what you need to do and get excited about somebody else who's running. We have sisters out here like Lauren Underwood who are running for Congress again. We got to flip the Senate and there's a lot of things at stake for everybody right this minute. And if we are able to succeed in flipping the Senate, we create a better landscape to fight. That is our job. Our job, 100%, is to A, stay alive, right? And B, to keep pushing to transform this democracy into what it needs to be and what we deserve it to be. <coughs> I got so excited. I just like mm -hmm. inhaled my own passion. Okay, mm -hmm. next question. This one is from Raquel. How do we raise the next generation of activists while incorporating the wisdom of past generations? I appreciate that question very much as a mom. Um, it's so sad because we actually, a, friend, a couple of friends of mine, and I don't know, it might be the same Raquel too, but uh, we proposed a uh, like, you know, how to raise our children as activists panel for like Netroots, um, which I don't know if it's gonna happen because of the COVID. Um, you know, in my book, if you, for, for folks who have gotten my book, and if you haven't, this, this should be the part that's worth it, is that my forward was written by Harry Belafonte, who many of you know is an iconic leader, civil rights leader, an entertainer, someone who really uh, put his money where his mouth is. He believes in the liberation of Black people. He believed in putting his money on Black people um, and really risked a lot of his, um, you know, you know, platforms um, for his people. And the reason why it was so important for me to get someone like Harry Belafonte to write the forward of my book is that because I wanted to show generations before me and after me that there would be no Linda Sarsour or Alicia or any of the movement leaders right now if it wasn't for the many people before us that came, um, uh, that many people that came before us. Um, and Harry Belafonte kind of alluded to that in his, in his, uh, 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 introduction in my book or in his forward. And so for me with, with young people, 
there's a lot of great books out there written by women of color and black women and black folks around teaching young people about those who came before them and activists in ways that kind of speak to them. And it's one of the reasons why I'm also committed to writing not only a young re reader's edition, um, but also writing a book um, for children. There will be a picture book that comes out next year uh, because I want our kids to be able to hold books in their hands that allows them to look at people who look like them. Representation on its own, um, it, there's some flaws to representation on its own, but it's very important for our young people to see folks who are powerful, who have power, who have influence, who are building power, who love their people, who are unapologetic about who they are. And so for me, my book is also an ode to my ancestors and the many women um, in my lineage who sacrificed much more than I will ever sacrifice um, to, so that I could be here today. I never lose sight of sitting in a room and saying, "Who sat on this seat before me?" You know, how did how did I get here? You know, how did I get on the stage of the Women's March? Um, and so for me, that instilling those stories in my in my children. I mean, even my kids right now, they're a little older, but like I had them during quarantine watch this great documentary, which is on YouTube called King in the Wilderness. Um, and it's a great documentary. It's actually not boring at all. I would, I would imagine middle school kids would even be able to watch it. I brought my kids all kinds of books since they were young around activism, around even the more generic like stories of our Rosa Parks. Like I've radicalized my kids and be like, actually, that's not what happened. Um, here's this. And, and, and my kids have uh, become just, I mean, their professors and even their high school teachers have often told me they're like, like I can't keep up with the, with the with the logic with the arguments that your kids make in class because I've taught my kids to question everything. Um, I've taught my kids uh, to read outside of what public schools are giving our children to read, and I think we are responsible as parents um, to make sure that we are uh, disrupting a system that has tried to teach us history in bits and pieces, whatever makes us comfortable, um, and not actually teaching history. Like I, my son, right now. Uh, is, you know, 20 years old. And I'm like, I literally yelled at him the other day. I was like, wait a minute, you have not read the autobiography of Asada Shapur? And he was like, oh my God. And I'm, and so, you know, my son's reading the autobiography book of, uh, of uh, autobiography of Asada Shapur. And he's so like, he keeps coming up to me like, yo, did this happen? Like, is this, oh my God. And he's like, so into it. And you wouldn't think, you know, that you have a 20 year old kid who doesn't have to read something that's reading something. So that's, I just encourage parents to always put things in front of your kids bring things from the outside. There's a lot of great books um, to, uh, or people to introduce to your children. And I think when your kids are introduced to, to them, there are ways for them to want to emulate those people. Um, and that's how I think a lot of us are here. We're trying to emulate our ancestors. Mm, that's beautiful. So last question before we have to wrap up, and it's a big one. <laughs> what are, this is from Aya, um, what are some new creative ways of engagement and organizing that you are excited about right now? You know, I'm a traditional organizer. Um, I'm a door knocker. Like a lot of my friends um, in New York think I'm crazy because I'm the person that always is like, okay, door knocking time. And everyone's like, really? Like, why do you like to talk to strangers? Um, I do think that we need to get back to some of the basics with a twist of some of the more innovative, creative ways of reaching people um, through culture, through music. Um, I've seen a lot of people do a lot of creative things, especially during this quarantine um, that I think is really amazing that kind of bringing people together. But I also believe in the power of relationship building, um, the power of being able to knock on someone's door. I mean, even within this quarantine, I'm part of a groups in New York City uh, that do mutual aid. And these are folks that, um, you know, you contact if you're an elder and you need someone to go get your groceries or you need someone to pick up your, you know, medicine from pharmacies. And I've uh, been part of this mutual aid network here in New York City. And it's powerful. I mean, even to be able to speak to an elder from the sidewalk and say, you know, are you okay? You know, what, what have you, what movies have you been watching? What have you been doing? And having someone be able to kind of feel like they start, start speaking to another human being. Um, and so I think, you know, after this kind of quarantine's over, I look forward to going back to knocking on doors, you know, not just about candidates, but about issues. I, I knock on people's doors around local campaigns, around, you know, I've, I'm the person that knocks on your door about things like, we need to get a street light on the corner of Bay Ridge Parkway and 4th Avenue. Like that's just the kind of person that I am. It's, it's, it's what fuels me. People fuel me. And so I hope more people can see and try. And I think political campaigns are a way to start what it feels like. Don't be shy, like knocking on people's doors, having conversations, going to the local parks and talking to strangers and giving them flyers about something. Um, I like digital also. I feel like this power of everyone, most people have smartphones and being able to send people texts and reminding them about where to show up and where to come. I'm excited about that um, um, and the continued continued usage of that. Um, but I'm just I'm ready to protest. Like I'm I'm like the minute we get out of here, like I'm out I'm out 
I'm ready. I don't care what it is. There's so much to protest. I just want to protest. That's where I'm going. That's real. real. (laughs) So we always ask our Commonwealth Club guests the same question, and we want to give you an opportunity to answer, which is what is your 60 second idea to change the world? My 60 second idea is to make every mayor, every governor and the White House black women. I love that. I love it. Well, Linda, thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us today here at Inforum at the Commonwealth Club. If you'd like to purchase a copy of Linda's new book, We Are Not Here to Be Bystanders, they are now available for purchase at your local bookstore or at barnesandnoble.com. If you want more virtual programs like this one, or if you want to support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making virtual programming, please visit commonwealthclub.org slash give. I'm Alicia Garza. We were honored to be here with Linda Sarsour. Thank you and please stay safe.